A lot of people are trying to avoid stress. The thing about that is smooth seas never made a great sound. So if you're sitting in low to no stress, as great as it sounds, it doesn't actually make you more resilient. And I thought to myself, what would motivate someone to leave an exotic island? And what I thought about it was, I don't think our purpose in life is to spend our life just sitting underneath a coconut tree. Lino Hola is a breathwork facilitator and founder of Men's Medicine and co-founder of the Breathe Room Global. Lino will help you break through past trauma to live a long and fulfilling life. I believe that most people understand that we have a nervous system. We've got a central nervous system, we've got an autonomic nervous system. The breath is as part of the autonomic nervous system. However, we can utilize our breath to be able to shift our state. And when we think about sympathetic, we're thinking fight or flight. When we think in parasympathetic, we're thinking rest and digest. We've got this as part of our human body to get your ass moving. How important is yeah. that couples do some of this breath work together? Nothing mirrors life back to you more than your partner. The question was, if everyone had breath work in their hands, like how would the world be? That's how I felt when I first experienced breath work. I came out of it and I was like, whoa, what was that? Now, you originally, there was a video um, you were involved in, you know, like the, the men telling their brothers, their, their friends that they love each other, uh -huh. um, which obviously hit a lot of people pretty deep. Yeah. Um, you know, whether that's just something that doesn't happen very often or, you know, people reflect on themselves and then they kind of go, well, maybe I should be doing this a little bit more. Mm -hmm. How important is it that we're surrounding ourselves in an environment with other men as blokes that we feel comfortable doing things like that? Super important. Mm -hmm. Super important in terms of the the sense that like a while back I sort of thought along, you know, around this sort of idea of surrounding ourselves with like minded men and the the conclusion that I came to was it's really important for us to be surrounded and exposed to all different kinds of men, not just different men from different races and different countries and cultures, but men that are at different stages of their life. Mm. From young men that are teens, transitioning into their adolescence, to men that are in their 20s and their 30s and their 40s, all the way up to you know, fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, elders, and that's how we learn really how to become men because we are exposed to such a wide range of what it means to be a man. So we get to help those that are on their journey, working their way to wherever we are. Let's say I'm, I'm 30 or I'm 40. So the, the youngins that are in their teens and their 20s and 30s, and then for those that are ahead of us, those are in their 40s and their 50s and their 60s up to their 70s, that gets to be somewhat of a blueprint that we can work off to build our own lives mm -hmm. and ourselves as men. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I guess it comes back like learning. How do you learn best? You learn best by passing on and, and teaching someone else as well. So mm -hmm. it reinforces, but it's funny, like being PT, like I just said to you then, like it's, you know, a lot, most of my clients are all older than me. And it's uh -huh. always so interesting. I think they have a bit of a paradigm shift in that there's so much to learn, not just because someone is younger than you doesn't mean that they don't have so much value still to provide and a different view of the world and a different all these other things as well, which probably taps into there. Like it's, you can educate and be the teacher, but while you may be older, you could also be the student from that younger person as well. Well, I, I think there was a while ago and um, I did have a group, a small handful of young men that were hanging around me. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Angry Dad. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So, like Mitch and some of my my some of the other boys that were hanging around it was like Mitch, my boy Jaden. He just had a child, you know, his daughter last week, um, which I'm godfather to, and uh, another friend Sam, and <coughs> all these young men were in their twenties, and I was in my late thirties when we started hanging out. Yeah. And what I realized was how much value that those young men were able to give to me, that they injected a energy of youthfulness mm. into my life right and it, it's not that i take life super seriously i just don't generally have a lot of small talk conversation not because i can't do small talk it's just because it doesn't really go anywhere mm. but that surface level conversation so when these young men were around me not only was i able to pass a lot of value onto them and and share with them but i noticed that their energy was quite infectious it brought a youthfulness to someone like myself who was older than them so i definitely think that there's a lot of value that young men can teach those that are older than them as well yeah and i guess as well from a point of view like it's some of these people may you know father figures or lack of in their lives mm. you know 
go to school, mostly female teachers, nothing wrong by those female teachers. Maybe it's just you go, well, blokes, why aren't we need more blokes trying to become teachers? Whatever, mm. who knows what the solution there is, mm. but you have such lack of male role models, that masculinity framing as well, mm. is that then you know that becomes such a great opportunity for people to speak with someone like yourself who's had more experience mm -hmm. to then learn some of those things that they missed out on as well. Yeah, 100%. I, I think so too. And there definitely is a shortage of, from my understanding, of male teachers. Mm. And maybe it's, you know, to add on to uh, having enough male role models around you, I guess it's really hard to even acknowledge that something is there if you're not even sure what to look for. Yeah. Right, so you could have a lot of great male rollers around you, but if the, there's not much conversation going on, you may not even know, you know, what journey the man that's around you has gone mm -hmm. through. Especially like if you think about young people that are surrounded by older people, they might look at the older guys as they're just an old man, mm -hmm. just an old dude. Right? What could you teach me? Right? Well, that person's lived a life; they've got some experience. <laughs> You know, mm. uh, so there's a lot of value that can be learned, but the conversation needs to be open, uh, opened. And once that conversation is, is open, you might realize you can learn a lot. There's so much available to you already around you. We just got to open the conversation first. Yeah, I think that's a common theme then say for people coming to the breathwork conversation as well becomes a lot of people like I know as a younger bloke, you kind of hear breathwork and initially and you're like, nah. You kind of go, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit tougher than that, whatever. And it's, but like having this open mind to be like, just give it a shot or try yeah. these new things, try, have mm -hmm. those conversations. And this is not limited to health and fitness whatsoever. This could be views mm -hmm. on the world, whatever it may be, relationships, you name mm -hmm. it. It's just so many people are narrow minded. They're not even willing to listen. Mm. And it's in that listening that you can learn so much. You may not agree with it, but at least you know that you've given it a crack to kind of mm. see the other side as well, um, which is. Very important. Yeah, it's interesting you sort of say that. Um, both of my mothers, they're my daughters, my children's mothers come from small country towns. Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter's mother comes from a small New South Wales country town called Gunnada, and then my my wife comes from a small country town called Inverell. And I was having a conversation with my business partner today, and just around how our environment impacts us. And you know, he sort of touched on that. He said, "Brother, you know." Both of the the mother to your ch mothers to your children, you know, come from a very Australian you know background mm -hmm. where you come from a big family. You know, you're one of twelve kids. Your parents, wow. you know, they're, they're, they're immigrants. They came from you know the islands to Australia. You also got like I got my daughter's the oldest of like thirty eight grandchildren as well that are under the age of eighteen. You know, so being exposed to so many people is a normal thing for me. Mm -hmm. But unless we're exposed to something, it really is hard for us to learn more, which is why it's so important to travel. Well, it's so, so important to open up conversations and to talk to people that are, that are a different to you, that are unlike mm -hmm. you. As much as it's valuable to surround yourself with like-minded people, it's also important for, to put yourself in into new spaces which is also something I've been doing this week, uh, is putting myself into other gyms. I went to multiple different fitness spaces this week. I went to I went to Neighborhood, which is in Miami Beach. I went on Monday, on Tuesday, I went to Never Quit in Burley. On Wednesday, I went to uh, Hed Hedges Run Club in Miami, yeah, my Mermaid Beach. I took a break on Thursday uh, and I went to a retreat, facilitated a retreat in Northern New South Wales. And then this morning I went down to Legacy in Miami. And the one thing that I took the most from those spaces was the value of culture. Yeah. And the reason why I went into all of these different places was just to see how people are moving and breathing. How are people breathing? And my instinct was that a lot of fitness people don't really think about the way that they breathe or their breathing technique. And the truth is your ability to be able to connect with your breath will influence your performance. Mm -hmm. But I had a gut feeling that the lack of attention to your breathing and your breathing technique has been impacting people's performance. So that's why I initially went to all of these gyms. But what I really took away from it was how there was Cult, a different culture in every single space and what I took away like this morning I really felt excited to go to this other gym not because it was just the gym but the value of what each place you know gave me mm -hmm. 
a different sense of feeling. And when I when I got to that gym, it was massive space, stacked out. The music was pumping, and I sort of walked in, and a smile was just on my face straight away. So there's so much value that we get from exposing ourselves mm. to different spaces, not only surrounding ourselves with like-minded people that are on our level as well. Yeah, well, I think you then get to challenge some of those. Like even if you still go back and be like, no, I was doing it the right way. It's yeah. kind of like, well, right way for you maybe, uh-huh. but you get to see like, uh, and uh, undoubtedly you'd still walk away and there'd be a few things, but I could implement X, Y, Z. Yeah. Or I really liked what that person was doing, whatever. There's always going to be something. Or on the flip side, you look at it and you go, I'm definitely not doing that because you uh-huh. could tell that how negatively that affected everyone in the room mm-hmm. or whatever it was. But like, it, I think it can be really easy. It's that comfort thing. You, uh, you know, we're humans like routine. We like habits. Mm-hmm. That's how we kind of optimize and be more productive is by mm-hmm. doing these same thing day in, day out. Mm-hmm. But sometimes you need a circuit breaker to expose yourself to some of that as well. And, and maybe that's also what I gained this week. Mm. It was an opportunity for me to get out of my normal routine and just just the value of variety. You know, as they say, variety is the spice of life. And I guess this week things have been spicy for me. Mm. But I'll tell you what, it has been sore. <laughs> They've had me working this week. <laughs> You're like, I'm ready to rest as well. <laughs> I definitely enjoyed the rest yesterday. My wife, she sort of massaged my quads. And when she was massaging my quads, I was like, Phew. Be careful. Chill, chill. They're tender. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess you tapped into there. You talked about obviously the breath work performance. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's one of the major things that you're involved with is, mm-hmm. is tapping into the breath. Um, I've noticed like say, um, I don't know if you, I think I saw you do a bit of jujitsu or maybe you have in the past. Maybe. Yeah. Yep. Um, I've been doing it for like four and a half months now. Uh-huh. Absolutely loving it. It's hell, but it's fun. Yes. And I find if I can maintain my nasal breathing for as long as possible, my decision making is better. A hundred percent. Like when when someone's like flattening you and you're like, <laughs> like you, you start to stress more, but when uh-huh. I can just, it, like it's hard and you obviously know that, yes. but you can tell the impact that mm. makes. Well, I joined a local um, MMA club called Combat, which um, is, I'm pretty sure is quite well known ar- around Australia. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alex Volkanovsky is somewhat mm-hmm. affiliated with these guys as well. And my business partner, we've got a, we've been building a breathwork system for the fitness industry. It's called TBR, or it's called the Breathe Room, or TBR for short. Now, the reason why I joined was because he does it, and he's a black belt. So the last session that I did with him, you know, we we were he was my partner, and usually I just rock up and I'll just train with whoever's you know good to train with, or mm. you know, sort of on my level. And while we were going through it, what I noticed was. He knows all the moves. Not does he only know all the moves, he's also got all the pieces. So it doesn't matter what I did, <laughs> like he had an answer for anything that I tried. And instead of, um, I'm probably about the same weight or a little bit heavier than him, I'm, I'm like about a buck, you know, 95 to about a buck. And he's about a little bit the same weight, maybe a little bit lighter than me. But instead of using my weight to sort of overpower him, I really wanted to learn. Mm. And the fact that he knew all of the moves and I was very mindful of what was going on, but he had me working. Not really, really hard, but enough to get me out of breath. And the one thing that I told myself was, as long as I can stay with my breath, I could possibly learn something because I had all the alarm bells ringing. I was like, overwhelm, overwhelm, overwhelm. I'm like, okay, don't lose your cool. Stay with your breath. Close your mouth. Breathe through your nose. You're just going to regulate your nervous system and you may be able to hear something that you could learn. Mm. And as that sort of started to happen, I could actually observe, absorb some of the things that he was trying to teach me and some of the things that he was trying to tell me. Mm. But the reason why I actually joined up was so that him and I could have those same conversations around jujitsu. And what I found was it was a great, it's a great stress reliever. Oh, it, the best thing after a big day, you just go there, there's no yeah. phones, there's just yeah. disconnect from the world. Like, mm. And especially for men. The ability to go belly to belly and chest to chest with each other is a really great value that all men could do with. And I feel that martial arts or physical contact or combat sports is really valuable for men. Uh, not only to be going, going belly to belly and chest to chest with each other, but the physicality. Mm. The physicality that we get out of it, the ability to be in that kind of a space you know, with men it forces you to problem solve really, really quickly. But the beautiful thing about jujitsu is, is there's no punching. 
right? As much as I love boxing and kicking and punching, people are, people just react really different when they get punched in the nose, mm. right? Oh, so <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so even out. though we <laughs> might be in training, if I punch somebody in the nose, I don't know how he's going to take that. Yeah. But jujitsu just has this way of being us being able to sort of feel each other without having to get severely upset because once you get punched in the nose, all of a sudden, like you can't see now, mm. right? You might you might start bleeding, you might start you know getting teary, right? And it's like the way that people respond to to a punch in the face, everyone responds mm. differently. And As, like, you had a shit day. <laughs> oh, we're on now. <laughs> exactly. So whoa, 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 we're just in training. Where jujitsu, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Right. We got a little bit more margin to work with there. Whereas a punch is just like bang. It's a punch in the nose. Who knows what's going to happen? Now. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And I find you, you talked about there, like being able to learn in that moment as well. And I always, at the first, like everyone knows, and you see all like the memes on Instagram of like mm. the skitty white belt, like the guy that's just like like a dog, he's gone crazy. Like, yeah. whoa, that was. And you do that. Everyone does that at the start because you're like, I don't want to lose. I don't want this. But then when you open up and find this ability to hit that bit of a flow. And that flow being where you can breathe a little bit better, you are open-minded. You find when someone does something on you, because you're inevitably be inevitably going to tap because you're gonna roll with a higher belt and they're gonna absolutely destroy you. And that's uh -huh. totally fine. That's the humble and the beauty of the sport as well. But in that, if you were all stressed out hyper, you're not learning what they did to you, how to avoid it next time. Exactly. If you're in that flow, you've got that open mind, you have clearer thoughts. You, you may be going a little bit slower, but when something happens to you, I go, I know what happened there. And then next time they try it on me, it doesn't work as easily at least. But if you're like all pent up, you can't do that. And it would be the same in business. It would be same in, you know, when you're studying for uni, if you're really stressed and you're in this, you know, quarters always through the ceiling, we, your mind is just all over the place. You're not going to be able to absorb that education that you've got in front of you right now. Mm -hmm. that, that was definitely my approach. Mm. If, if I just use my body weight to overpower him, I don't think I'm going to learn anything. All I'm doing is, you know, it's something that I, I already understand that's possible. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to learn. I want to learn. You know, like this is this is completely new to me. So I'm, I'm really enjoying myself there. Yeah, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, you talk about nervous systems in there. Mm -hmm. Can you run me through parasympathetic, sympathetic? What's the difference? When are we trying to unlock them for different situations? Well, <clears throat> for those, you know, I, I believe that most people understand that we have a nervous system. Right, we've got a central nervous system, we've got an autonomic nervous system, and within our autonomic nervous system, the the term autonomic kind of implies that it happens automatically, which it does. The thing about the breath is it's part of the autonomic nervous system. However, we can utilize our breath to be able to shift our state. And you know, when we think about sympathetic, we're thinking fight or flight. You know, our trauma responses, when we think in parasympathetic, we're thinking rest and digest. Mm. And that the way that our body responds to any sort of incident will influence which part of our nervous system that we're going to be sitting in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah? So for those, and, and I've been going through this with my with my boy, you know, AB, Alex Butchies, that's my business partner, and- We've been, we're actually on the module right now around nervous system. And the models that we've been looking at is, you know, things around stress and how stress impacts our bodies. And I've been really loving the graphs that we've been looking at because we've been modeling what it looks like, you know, for the average fitness person or just the average person. And if we think about low stress, a lot of people are trying to avoid stress and that they want to sit in low stress. The thing about that is that um, a smooth seas never made a great sailor. Mm. So if you're sitting in low to no stress, as great as it sounds, it doesn't actually make you more resilient. There's, there's literally no stress there, yeah. right? But if we're sitting in high stress, it's no better, right? You, you're, you're only like moments away from flipping out, but also mm. there's also no high heart rate variability here. There's no wipe, there's no down. Yeah. So when it comes to breath work and impacting our nervous system and our stress levels, we have the ability to affect our heart rate, you know, our HRV, mm. and also to be able to switch between our nervous system, between parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. When we connect our breath into it, our breath has the ability that when we exhale, the real key is in the, the values in the exhale. Mm. Uh, so when we talk about taking a breath, everyone thinks, well, we'll take a deep breath. Most people are thinking, they go, 
and they'll suck their belly in straight away, right? If you think about blowing into a balloon, when you blow into a balloon, when you breathe into it, does it inflate or deflate the balloon? Inflate. It inflates it, right? So that's what should, what should happen with our mm-hmm. bodies. When we breathe into our bodies, our body should expand. When we exhale, we allow ourselves to tap into that parasympathetic nervous system. And this is, a, this is the thing that I love about breath work. It has the ability to influence your nervous system in a really effective and simple way. And the other thing is it's yours. Mm-hmm. It's free. But it's a thing that I think that most people don't realize that they can tap into. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah? I think it was a, like a powerful guy I talked to a couple of weeks ago. He was talking about like, I don't think people understand like just how important the breath is. Yeah. It was like, oh, you can survive X days without food, X time without water, yes. without air, without oxygen. Yeah. Not very long at all. Yeah, I think the record is like five to seven minutes or something like that. Yeah. Most people struggle on a 10 second breath retention. Mm. 30 seconds most people are looking to tap out but the the stronger we build a relationship with our breath in our body the longer we're able to stretch that you know we also get to increase our window of tolerance as well mm. our ability to be able to be there and how that impacts our lives is it allows us to be in our lives regardless of how much stress is going on and yeah. you get to take it just for what it is not for more than it is or not for less than it is. So you're not becoming complacent, but you're not becoming overactive as well. Mm. You're just present. And I guess that's something that most people are lacking in today's society. Yeah. And I guess when we talk about being able to um, be in the sympathetic or the parasympathetic nervous system, the intention, as we spoke about high and low stress, the intention isn't to just be sitting in your parasympathetic nervous system all the time. Mm. (laughs) As we spoke about, you know, smooth seas dysregulating the nervous system is important. However, if you have no control of your breath in your body, your body can become dysregulated quite often or just live in a dysregulated state, like we spoke before about um, high stress. Mm. So putting yourself into stressful situations is a valuable thing. Dysregulating your your nervous system purposely is a really valuable thing, which is something that I do with a lot of my guys all the time. Putting them into um, into dysregulation and then teaching them how to regulate from that place. Yeah, I guess there's a few things in there that I've kind of taken as well. It was like so, you know, for, maybe <coughs> for some people that are not quite understanding mm-hmm. the importance of not just being like low stress all the time, it's like, well, if you're in the gym and you're doing a really easy weight all the time, mm-hmm. your muscles won't grow similar sort of state but if you're in a high level of stress and you're like overloading you go into failure on every single set you're training seven days a week for two hours Mm. well you're not recovering and so it's finding that balance in there then another thing that i kind of thought of is that low stress and where you know we've obviously tapped in and talked about like men masculinity male role models is that purpose is a massive part of like a man's life and happiness if that's kind of a term or being content with your life i guess is a, a good way of putting it is that if you're coasting all through life there's mm-hmm. probably not much purpose there's probably not much that mm. you're striving for and that's healthy i think some people can try and you know we we either love hustle co- culture or demonize it there's yeah. no hey how about it's okay to have a bit of both well it's kind of like we think about that as quite an extreme approach right we're either chilling Mm. Oh, we're stressed out. Yeah. Right. We're going hustling, grinding. What about this space in between? Mm. Right. Life isn't so black and white. There's so much color in between this. Mm. And like life, your life is your canvas. How do you want to paint? What kind of pictures do you, you want to create? How would you choose and like to express your life? How would you like to experience your life? Mm. Yeah. A concept I sort of thought about my parents, they come from a small group of islands in the South Pacific called Tonga. And you know, I thought to myself, what would motivate someone to leave an exotic island, right? You're there, you got everything that you need, there's abundance yeah. there. And what I thought about it was, I don't think our purpose in life is to spend our life just sitting underneath a coconut tree, mm. right? Nice that, in, in, in periods. Yeah, <laughs> right, sounds really great. Yeah. But if the average lifespan is 80 years, that's a long time to be chilling, right? to just be fishing and coconut trees. Mm. I think, so the way I sort of thought about it, what would motivate my mother and father to leave Tonga at a young age? Like my parents, they met in Sydney. Mm. Um, My dad, he left and migrated to New Zealand first, went back to Tonga, caught a cruise ship, I guess, 
literally fresh off the boat, right? Mm. Caught a boat from Tonga over to Sydney and that's how we got to Australia. What would motivate him to do that, you know, at 18 years of age? And I guess it's the desire and the, and the sense of feeling with the inside of you that I can do stuff. Yeah. I can do more. I can do more than just work on a farm. I can do more than just fish. And I think that goes, you know, for all humans. We have the ability to do more with our lives than just chill. Mm. And we were t- I literally was talking about stress this morning and we were thinking about, we were talking about a few different terms, you know, around stress, uh, de-stress, this stress, sue stress, which is like no stress, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then you stress, <laughs> right? You stress is good stress. Yeah. So this is where we start to get really great heart rate variability where we allow ourselves to be stressed out. But if you can apply some really powerful, or beautiful or effective um, nervous system regulation techniques like breath work, like a physiological sigh, like LSD, which is a light, soft, deep you know, breath work mm-hmm. technique, that can allow you to regulate your nervous system, allow it to come down multiple points, live in this sort of operational stress zone, mm-hmm. which allows you to actually expand that and decrease those high stress and moderate stress you know, zones. <laughs> when those times come again, and the graphs that we're sort of playing around, like if you think about, do you ever train two a day? Like twice a day. Yeah, year. twice yeah, a day. Yeah, yeah. Like jits and gyms yeah, or double up. Right. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes you might train to a day. So if you're training twice a day, beginning of the day, you might do cardio, you might do your weight session, and maybe you might go to jujitsu mm. in the evening. Then through the day, you're training your clients. So there's a lot of activity sort of going on. So your heart rate availability is going up and down. And without breath work, you don't really bring your nervous system mm. back down. You just kind of go from gym to now I'm working. Mm-hmm. right and then you're going to go jiu-jitsu and then you're up and then now you got to try and dial yourself back down and expect to get a restful night's sleep and you think about the compounding effect of this and when we were sort of building these graphs we were talking about the concept of rpe what if you could apply rpe to your life not just to training you know, for those that don't understand, rate of perceived exertion, right? So when we're training, you have the ability to rate what that sort of felt like. What if you could give RPE to your own stress levels? It might feel like it's a 10, but it's actually a five mm. because I'm actually having a trauma response right now. So it feels like high alert, right? But in the bigger scheme of things, it's actually not. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. If we can close the gap on our perception of what it is and what it really is, we're able to find ourselves back into homeostasis a lot easier. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm sitting there, I'm going, oh, fuck, I'm going to have to do this myself, I feel like, because it's interesting. Like, it's, it, I say it, it, it's always funny. Once again, now paradigm shift for me. I say it to my clients. I go, we can never know what a 10 out of 10 is until we take a set to failure. Yeah. And it's the same here. You can mm. never know what a 10 out of 10 is stress is until yeah. you've gone there and you've absolutely just gone oh my god i'm wrecked and this like, is what i this is what i love about training is that it's so highly reflective of life yeah. when you're in the gym you know you are metaphorically stressing yourself out the same way that we do in our life but your ability to be able to be in those painful moments when you're training when you're stressed out when you're elevating your nervous system mm. right being at the gym, being able to recover and then go again and recover and go again. It's the same thing out there, you know, in life. So just the same as when we start training, no one knows what they're doing. Mm. Also, everyone is like a newborn calf when they start training. Everyone's average. I remember the first time when I started training, I I played football majority of my my childhood up into my teens. And then I think I joined the gym. I did my personal training course back in 20, 2003. Mm-hmm. So like over 20 years ago. And towards the end of it, I thought, I should probably join the gym, huh? <laughs> now, when I joined the gym, I remember the very first time that I did bench press. I put two plates on each side and I started benching. Jeez, did that look wonky, <laughs> right? It started going everywhere. I was like, whoa, this is crazy. Yeah, and because I didn't warm up, I didn't build it up. I just thought I'll just throw two plates on, Mm. right? So I had to go back to the dumbbells and bent. And I was doing dumbbells for twelve and a half. And I'm like, I'm just starting off at scratch. This is where we're going to start. So the same thing that we were experiencing stress, right? At the beginning, 
when we, especially when we do new things or even when we start to work on ourselves, it can feel really, really difficult. However, what something felt at the beginning may not be what it feels like the further on that you work with it. Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah. Especially in a work, it can be quite confronting. Because when we talk about inner work, it could be, you know, something small, an ineffective behavior and pattern that you've been trying to overcome that's been troubling you. Maybe it could be something like a relationship with money, mm. right? And it's causing chaos in your life or relationships themselves. But the better, the, the, the more we expose ourselves to it and what's supposed to happen is we should get better over time, <laughs> right? So what felt really daunting at the beginning, which might have been a 10, you get better at it and you start to realize it's not a 10. Yeah. It's, it's like a five, right? Uh, and you're not only better at it, but you can also do more with it. The challenge is, is always there, mm. right? Our relationship with these things, like they're always there. But what we perceived it to be, that mountain at the beginning, I'm scared of relationships. I'm scared of opening up my heart. You know, um, I don't know what to do with money. I make money. I lose money. I make mm. money. I spend money. You know, you might make, uh, there's a lot of people out there that are on six figures and they blow it every week. They're literally living week to week. Mm. Six figures is not short change. Yeah. Then, yeah. So, yeah. So, perception, you know, perspective is everything. Yeah. And our ability to be able to bridge the gap from what we perceive something to be and what it really is, this is where our work is. Yeah. yeah. I guess that's where it's massively like it's your internal speaking um yeah. it's your you know um what you what you think and this is for the good and the bad like when i have this i will feel this way yeah. is likely not going to feel as good as you think it will like when yeah. i get this new car or when i buy this new house when i start making six figures i'll be happy the same is that is likely not going to be as much of a high is the low you're also perceiving is not going to be as bad yeah. like if i came here today and i was like oh what if i stumble my words what if i mess something it's like you're probably not going to care yeah. You know, like, but you can easily pent that up in yourself. Maybe it's out of high expectations. Maybe that's, you know, like you, you, you talk about, we all have our traumas and, you know, a lot of people hear trauma and they just think the most extreme sort of worst case scenario, things that could happen to a human being. Mm. It's like, but there are those like more day-to-day -day traumas maybe that the money things like you're scared to spend $5 because maybe growing up your parents didn't like to spend money. Yeah. And you go, that's not a real, that's not a big trauma, but it's a trauma. Yeah, it comes from a place, right? Yeah. And it impacts your life in some kind of way, shape, or form. Yeah, is that where you 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 like trying to acknowledge and teach people and and make them aware that just because their trauma is not as bad, quote unquote, as somebody else's, maybe you know they didn't have this terrible upbringing, doesn't mean that that's still not trauma. Similar with mental health, like we all have our own problems, no matter how big or small. Y yeah, yeah, I, I definitely would say so. Like, there's we all have our stuff. The way I look at it is is that life is pretty good, mm. right? And why aren't we possibly experiencing it in that way? Mm. You know, and whatever it is that's in between where you're at and that good life that already exists, this is where our work is, right? And your work is your work, you know? So for instance, I grew up in a very um, rough household, right? A tough upbringing mm -hmm. and my wife didn't. However, she has her things and I have my things. Like it's undeniable. We all have our own stuff yeah. and it's not a competition, you know? So whilst she wasn't exposed to what I was exposed to or what I experienced in my childhood and my upbringing, it doesn't take away for, from what her experience in her childhood and her ineffective behaviors and patterns and programs and conditioning mm. and how that's impacted her life. It still impacts her life. Yeah. I think it was mm. that, that, that comes back to the, you know, don't, <laughs> You know, bleed on people that didn't hurt yeah. you in the first place sort of thing, isn't it? It's like regardless of what you've gone through, you have an opportunity to try and make it that little bit better for the next people that you, or the people that you're interacting with on a day-to-day -day basis as well. Mm. Um, mm. I guess with the breath work more specifically, um, you know, people go, out right, here, cool. This is amazing. It's this wonderful thing. It can do this. What are some examples? I go, I'm trying to get to sleep. I'm trying to boost my energy. Um, what are, you know, obviously they're two very different ones, but what are some of the techniques that people can be using and implementing to do those things? With, with tea, but so uh, my two companies are Men's Medicine and TBR. And if we think of, of them both on a spectrum, Men's Medicine is the more deeper stuff we do. So we do, I guess, a lot of 
uh, emotional, energetic, trauma release stuff over here. The deep inner work is what we do over here, which is like the 20% of people that are willing to work on this stuff. Mm. Then we think about what about the rest? What about the masses that aren't experiencing these deep traumatic things? So that's what TBR is for, is for the everyday person, right? Now, when it comes to our breathwork techniques over here with TBR, our intention here is activation, regulation, release. That our breath has the ability to do such a variety of things. It has the ability to get us moving, get us activated. It has the ability to regulate our nervous system. Also has the ability to allow us to blow off some extra extra steam. So with TBR, we do everything bar trauma release work, Mm -hmm. right? But we bump up against it. So... Like let's say you're training your client and you're training your client and you know some stuff's going on and they've just started to share some stuff with you, right? So you might provide them with some breathwork techniques to help regulate their nervous system, but you're noticing there's still something there. You get what I'm saying? Mm. If you have the ability to help support them just to offload and blow a little bit of steam off, just enough to take the edge off, right? That could buy them some time. That could buy them some time before they actually need to see someone, you know, um, professionally. Yeah. Does does that make sense? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So the breathwork techniques that we use should be specific to the need that you're experiencing. Breathwork can get us moving. So with the activation, all of those techniques should get you moving, should get your ass moving. We want to be tapping into that sympathetic nervous system. So for those that think about fight or flight or the sympathetic nervous system, it serves a purpose. Mm. Like we've got this as part of our human body to get your ass moving, Mm. right? So with our activation techniques, our intention is sharp, fast, powerful. With I guess our regulation techniques, it's about transitioning out of that fight or flight back into the parasympathetic. So a really simple technique there is to allow your exhale to be longer than what your inhale is. The The science behind the ratio is a one to two cadence, mm-hmm. right? Or a 0.5. So let's say you were inhaling for two, you would exhale for four. Or you could do it inhale for three, exhale for six. Or you could transition into some heart-mind coherent stuff. So when we breathe in and out for the same tempo, it creates heart-mind coherence. So you'd utilize something like box breathing. doesn't matter what the count is. As long as it's all equal tempo and equal sites, you're going to achieve not only heart-mind coherence, but you're also going to expose yourself to some co2 tolerance work Mm -hmm. because there is a breath retention at the top and the bottom there's a breath retention on a full lung as well as an empty lung as well on an empty lung we have low o2 levels which is also going to mean that we're going to have high co2 levels because the co2 is going to start rising right because you've already got low o2 Mm. now you've got even extra co2 so you're going to build a tolerance with carbon dioxide and how that benefits you is is co2 wants to stimulate us to breathe so for those that struggle with breath retentions co2 tolerance work can help you broaden your window of tolerance Mm. so in stressful moments you can actually be in them a little bit better uh, things like NSDR, non-sleep deep rest, or LSD, light soft deep. For those that aren't aware of you know, LSD, they're probably thinking, oh, psychedelics, <laughs> right? But LSD comes from a place called the Buteco Method or the Buteco Clinic, uh, which is a clinical style of breath work, which is the most beneficial one, you know, uh, if you ask me, because it stimulates the most nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. For those that understand what nitric oxide is, it's a natural vasodilator. It's also the most active ingredient. It's in a lot of pre-workouts, right? And it's the active ingredient in Viagra as well, Mm -hmm. right? So you can access this yourself with your breath. When we um, practice light, soft, deep LSD, nasal breathing, that's the technique that actually releases more nitric oxide than any of the other ones. But it's also really subtle as well. So if you're looking to go to sleep at the end of you know your day, something like LSD is a really beautiful way to help calm your nervous system. 
So things like uh, at the beginning of the day, some Kapala Bhakti or some Pranayama techniques or Bastrika, that's an active inhale, active exhale for Kapala Bhakti. Bastrika is an active inhale, active exhale. Uh, that's great for activation. Get your butt moving. Mm-hmm. Nervous system regulation, some heart-mind coherence or a one to two cadence will benefit you there. And at the end of the day, if you're wanting to, to get some sleep, some LSD can help you know, guide you into a deep rest uh, into a sleeping state. So what does that look like specifically? Like if I'm laying in bed, what am I doing exactly so, in that moment? So the thing about LSD is it looks like nothing's happening at all, right? So you want to breathe so light, so soft, so deep as if you are not breathing at all. So what happens is when we breathe into our nasal passage, your breath goes through an area. So in your, your nasal passage, you have these things called the concha. So when the breath goes past through the concha, it acts like turbines, it spins the air, which we, which humidifies the air. And because there's nasal hairs in our, na- there's hairs in our nasal passage that also filters the air. So you've now got clean, warm air that's going through your nasal passage. When you do LSD, you want to breathe as if you're barely, you know, moving those nasal hairs at all. So as that breath goes in through your nasal passage, down the back of your nasal passage, there's an area called the paranasal. When that brushes past, your breath past the paranasal, it, mm-hmm. it'll stimulate the release of nitric oxide. So as you're starting to breathe LSD, I also like the term long, slow, and deep as well. So if you can breathe long, slow, deep nasal breaths, light, soft, deep nasal breaths, that's what's going to help benefit you yep. the most when it comes to breathing LSD. Mm-hmm. You want to be breathing so light, so soft, so deep that you are barely moving your nasal yeah. hairs at all. Yeah. And then when it comes to, so, you know, in there you've talked about the box breathing and all these sort of things. When when are we using nasal breathing versus when are we using uh, our mouth to breathe? Because obviously a big thing, like you said, like it, the, the big bonus of breathing through the nose is that cleaning and everything. That's, you know, mouth is for eating, nose is for breathing. Yes. But some of these techniques do use mouth breathing as well. Is that more yeah. the activation stuff that taps into the mouth? Activation and release. Obviously, it's a bigger airway, so we're going to have a bit more of an experience. I still do prefer nasal breathing through activation techniques. Mm -hmm. Um, I do add a little bit of mouth breathing into uh, some of my activation techniques. And the reason I do that is because it just activates more. But I can never, I struggle to, I I always love to ensure that we are still benefiting from breathing in and out the nose. Mm. Yeah, so if you can sort of liken it to training, is like the difference in your performance to warming up and not warming up. Yeah. Right. As much as you just want to roll into your workout, that warming up is actually going to support you to perform better. Yeah. Yeah. So same thing with breath work. There's so much value that you gain from nasal breathing to just not do it at all. You just you've lost a whole bunch of benefits. Yeah. Yeah, even if you're doing an activation. But I do add purely mouth breathing into some of my activation techniques is because it just delivers more of an experience, right? It activates more. And if it's an activation, well, why wouldn't you want to use it? Yeah. Mm. I did a, a technique the, a couple of weeks ago um, with the same guest I was talking about, and it was um, like the 30 hard breaths in and out through the mouth, yep. get a little bit lightheaded and whatever. And I, but like after it, I was like, oh my God, I feel alive. Like it was yeah. incredible and it was crazy. And then we went through that box breathing and I was like, okay, now it's time to just sit back and relax. Yeah. I was like, that is, and we, like doing it back to back, I still felt like it was that quick that I was able to change a state of mind. Um, and, you know, once again, someone will be like, yeah, well, that's also because you knew the placebo you wanted. I'm like, oh, it worked. <laughs> Even yeah. if there's an element of that, it still did yeah. the thing. But I just, I was blown away by how quickly i could go between the two complete opposite ends of the spectrum did you want to do a breath a priming technique yeah it would be great yeah, yeah so what i'm gonna get you to do is i want you to there'll be three stages to it the first round will be all through your nose nothing through your mouth mm-hmm. the second round will be in through your nose out through your mouth the third and the last round will be all through your mouth nothing mm-hmm. through your nose mm-hmm. Round one will be 10 breaths, followed by a 10-count hold. Round two will be for 20 breaths, followed by a 20-count hold. Round three, all through your mouth, nothing through your nose, followed by a 30-count hold after the last exhale. You take a full breath into your nose, and we'll pause at the top before returning back to our normal breath. So I'll count you through, right? And all I want you to do is just focus on Mm -hmm. the breathing. So the first round, all through your nose, nothing through your mouth. So look and sound something like this. 
Okay, so pretty rapid. Yeah, rapid. So because it's an activation, we want to get a bit of a tempo, a bit of pace on it. Mm -hmm. Round two, in through your nose, out through your mouth. <laughs> right? I want this all to be diaphragmatic breathing as well. So you're going to breathe from the belly, mm -hmm. right? Everything from the midline. This is basically where we're breathing from. We're not really involving the upper chest on this. Mm -hmm. So your belly is working like a pump. Round three, all through your mouth, nothing through your nose. <coughs> so when you change the shape of your mouth, it will change the intake of the air. Because if we open our mouth, it's probably going to dry the back of your throat. Mm. So if you close the shape of your mouth, you're going to find the intake of air a lot more easier to breathe with. Yeah. Does this make sense? Yeah, definitely. Now, so I'm just sorry, nose, quickly, before, nose, mouth, mouth. Yep. Before we jump in there, why the diaphragm not through the chest before we get into it? Deeper breathing is going to allow you to get more quality benefits. Mm. When we have shallow breathing, this is what's going to put us into, I guess, that that sympathetic state, which is, well, that fight or flight. Yeah. You know, this is where anxiety, panic attacks come from. They come from shallow breathing, mm -hmm. right? We're not really, and the thing is, when we talk about diaphragmatic breathing, you can't breathe without tapping into your diaphragm. Yeah. But what we, we're looking for is deeper breathing, mm -hmm. which is why we're wanting to work beneath the midline here. Because because it's an activation, if we were to in, in, uh, introduce mm -hmm. the upper chest, we can, but I wanted to keep this compact. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. So we want to punch this out. We want this to be really punchy mm -hmm. and and, uh, and rapid and fast. Yeah. Right? So 10, 20, 30, 10 breaths, 10 count hold. 20 breaths, 20 count hold, 30 breaths, 30 count hold, 30 count hold at the top, then return back to a normal breath. And... Nose, nose, mouth, all through your mouth. Have all we right. got this? So I'll count you Beautiful. right when you go through it. Okay, you ready to breathe? Good to go. All right. Feel free. Actually, I might get you to do this with your eyes closed, mm -hmm. right? Because you're probably going to find it hard to um, keep yourself present mm -hmm. with your eyes open. You're probably going to get a little bit lightheaded. You're probably going to get a little bit dizzy, mm -hmm. right? So just previewing that. Beautiful. Okay, get ready to breathe. All through your nose, nothing through your mouth. 10 breaths in three, two, one, and breathe. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Full breath in, full breath out. Holding for 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Nose, mouth. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten, nine, eight, seven. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Full breath in, full breath out. Pause, drawing that belly button to your spine, emptying the belly and the lungs. It's 20 count, hold at the bottom. With 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. One last round, all through your mouth, 30 breaths. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, twenty, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Full breath in, full breath out. Empty, 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 empty. Pause. 30 count hold at the bottom. Resisting the urge to breathe, allowing yourself to drop a little deeper within as you just take this moment to put a pause on your breath. You may feel a little buzzy, a little lightheaded, a little tingly, just allowing those tingling sensations to wash over your body. Teeth touching, lips, lips sealed, tongue to the roof of your mouth, getting ready to follow this up with a Long, slow breath in through your nose in three, two, one. Taking a long, slow breath in through your nose, filling your belly and your lungs up with oxygen. When you get to the top, pause. This is our last piece. And just maintaining this breath retention at the top. Resisting the urge to breathe once again, allowing yourself to drop a little deep within. Beautiful for 10 Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Long, slow breath out through the mouth for me, please. 
Beautiful. Just allow yourself to center as you start to come back to, back into your body. And when you're ready, feel free to blink your eyes back open. That's good. It's interesting as well doing, because like those more rapid breaths as well, I found like they can make you feel a little bit, or oh, how are you going? Closing yeah. the eyes definitely helps with that feeling as well. Mm. I think because it removed, for me, it was removing compared to when I did it with my eyes open, removing this, that I could see myself getting a little tingly yeah. so that I wasn't thinking and stressing about that quite so much as well. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, yeah. We'll, so when our eyes are open, we're, we're exposed to stimulus. Mm. So we close them, allows us to turn a little deeper within. How are we feeling right now? A lot more dialed, actually. Like, I feel like it, uh, more tunnel vision, I guess, with my like approach to things now as well felt good before yeah obviously that's probably the caffeine that was doing that as well but yeah. now like i do feel like you just kind of it's more central less mm. noise less distraction less outside and the beautiful thing about that primer breath uh, we call that a primer breath because basically it's just designed to prime you mm. is that it exposes you to three different breath breathing techniques purely nasal breathing nose mouth and then just mouth you notice how each technique made you feel a little different yeah yeah Definitely, especially like the the massive first and third one, big difference. Yeah. I mean, sure, like the extended 30 versus 10, but also just like where I could feel it coming through as well. It was so much easier to kind of open up here, whereas the mouth one, you could feel it wanting to climb up a little bit more. And I mm. felt after a couple of those breaths, then like the shoulders, so I could tell I'd obviously brought myself up a little bit as well. Mm. Um, I don't know whether that's something I should be focusing on trying not to do quite so much as well um, over time. Well, I guess if you think about it, like at that point, you'd hit a bit of momentum. Mm. So like at that point, your body's just doing whatever it wants to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's mm. that flow state to some extent as well, which is probably good. Yeah, yeah. Because now you're just in it now. Yeah. And like you're ready to go. Yeah, yeah. So if I asked you, would you like to go train now? What would you say? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that's it. It's like I could, you could do any work now. Like yeah. you do feel like a lot more into it, mm. um, which is pretty powerful. Like it's, like I said, like it's not too long ago, I would have been like, nah, I'm not doing that. Yeah. But it's powerful op having that open mind to then experience it. And once you do try it, you're like, oh, that's actually pretty good. I like that's, that. That's how I felt when I first experienced breath work was when I came out of the breath work experience and it was, and it was a deep release, you know, it's style of breath work. I came out of it and I was like, whoa, what was mm. that? Right, I need to, and I've been obsessed ever since. Yeah, how how important then? Like, is I notice you do some couples stuff as well. Is yeah. that couples do some of this breath work together? Maybe that trauma sort of dealing with together. Breath work is in everything that I do. Mm -hmm. This is the the level of versatility of breath work, and the reason why that we even cre created TBR to start off with was to be able to put the power in the people's hands. Mm -hmm. The question was, if everyone knew, if everyone had breath work in their hands, like how would the world be? Yeah. If everyone knew how to regulate their own nervous systems, how would that change the world? What would you think? Quite a bit. Quite a bit. Right? Especially when they're in that pent up state. Yeah. About to lash out at someone. Exactly. Like, especially if we're in a relationship, mm -hmm. nothing, nothing mirrors life back to you more than your partner, right? And, and the reason why I believe that is, is because that's the person we share our life with. Yeah, they see sides of you that nobody else does, right? And you know, and that in itself, like, is is a journey. I remember my wife when we first got together uh, after a couple of weeks or a couple of months, you know, us being together. I think it was a couple of weeks. I used to say to her, "I said, hey, how come you wear a shirt to bed all the time?" And she goes, "What do you mean?" I said, "You know, I've already seen you naked, hey." And she was just like, oh, I got a bit self-conscious. And then, um, you know, I remember, you know, and these are like things that sort yeah. of happen, you know. Um, even something as simple as leaving the toilet, the bathroom door open. Yeah. Right. And I, would, I remember saying to her, I said, you know, I know what's going in there. Hey. She goes, yeah, but I don't want you to see. <laughs> right. And there's so many parts of us and there's plenty of men that are probably hearing this and like, you know what, 100%, <laughs> right? Me, I'm like, I'm an open door policy. My office door, my front door, bathroom door, my bedroom door. Mm. Like I just close doors. The only reason I want a closed door is because I'm looking for some rest. Yeah. Right. Close the door. I'm going to sleep. You know, don't, don't distract me. Yeah. yeah. Um, but when we're in relationships, we see parts of our partners that other people don't. Mm. 
They see parts of us that we don't. So the ability to be able to utilize breath work to not only regulate our nervous system, but also release as well. You know, there's there's so many things that we bring into a relationship and trauma is one of those things. Yeah. You know, and especially if people are connecting you know, via trauma, and for those that aren't aware of trauma bonding, mm. you know, breath work is one of these things that we can use to help overcome and dissolve the bulk of that, if not all of that. But we all have our own core wounds. There are things, and a lot of people look at wounds as a negative thing, and it can be if that's where you live your life. However, for the most part, for all of us, our wounds, our core wounds, are also the things that are the catalyst for our greatness as well. Mm. How did you get into fitness? It was probably, well, dad was a strength and conditioning coach, sister was a professional soccer player, yeah. mum played netball. Yeah. The whole family, I was an athlete. Yeah, it's the it norm. It made sense. How did you get into the desire to be able to expand more podcasts, coaching, all of these sorts of things. So you, you've taken it beyond fitness now. Mm. It was definitely, the once again, the environment of how I was raised, how I was brought up, mm. maybe teachers as well. Um, yeah. But definitely massively like that family dynamic of, you know, exploring what your potential could be. Yeah. So like we're all motivated to do something. Is there a part of you that also, you know, um, does it because, you know, you know like we're – there's an impact of our relationship, of our of our family, mm. you know. So, like, when your parents, they're proud of the growth and, and the impact that you're making. Mm. How does that make you feel? Good, <laughs> right? There's these there's attachments sort yeah. of everywhere, and without, is there a part of it that motivates you? You know, because of the family that you come from. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, right. And like, if that wasn't there, you and I wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation. No. Yeah, you know, you wouldn't be striving for more. You know, if there wasn't some kind of an element that was a contributing factor from your family. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, and this is why I say perspective is everything because some people look at that. There are plenty of people in this world that look at that as it's too much pressure. Yeah. You know, like, geez, could you just let me live my life? You know, and it's like, that's feedback. That's feedback between parent and child. It's like, mm -hmm. you know what? Your kid doesn't want to play tennis. Like, sorry to hear, your kid might be the next, you know, star. However, they don't care. Yeah. You know, there's something else that they really, you know, enjoy. Like my daughter, I grew up playing sport, athletics, sport, loved it. My daughter doesn't really care. Mm. And when she was going through primary school, she was really great at swimming. And so was her mother. Right, her mother was like a national swimmer. I was always loved going to regionals. Never really ever made state. Loved ma making rep teams. So it's just you, you would understand. Yeah. It's it's a it's a, it's an energy about yeah. it, right? Nothing greater than going to a carnival meet. It's electric. Like, yeah, it's so right. So good, and especially when you're playing at a top level as well, right? Because we're we're performing, you know, we're, with the best of the best. Yeah. So like, it's it's hard. It's fast. You know, it's, it's awesome. But my daughter didn't care. I couldn't force her. I couldn't force her to join Little Athletics. I couldn't get her to go to Nippers. Yeah. I couldn't get her to do any of these things. She played like Nepal and it was like a Division Three, and she thought it was awesome. <laughs> she thought they were training so hard, uh, playing so hard, and I was like, but that was her experience. Yeah. And she loved it. Who am I to take that away from her? You know, I couldn't force her to do something. So from parent to child, it's important for us to be able to to observe these, you know, these, these sort of things. But family dynamics, they play a big part in the way that we live our lives, the way that our children, you know, experience their lives. And when it comes to relationships themselves, we all come into relationships with our own shit. Yeah. Sorry for the French, right? But we all come into relationships with our own baggage. Breathwork is one of those things that allows us to actually meet each other. Yeah. And I think, I guess, you probably within that, when you can sit with those, say, from a personal experience, like I said, so some, like how some people could perceive what maybe how my parents um, 
have me feeling the way I do about work and work ethic and all hard work and all that sort of stuff, they may see that as a negative. It's like, mm. but if I can sit back and channel and be like, well, what actually is going on here? Well, one thing I, I can always say my parents did really well was they just gave me a shit ton of opportunities. Yeah. They never told me, force me to do anything. Uh -huh. Now, the odd time, if you're like, I don't want to do this sport anymore, you might be a little bit like, oh, what's the response going to be? And it was fine. Yeah. But it was always, it was more around the action of doing something, of trying something and of going out there and trying to be, it was the best version of yourself it wasn't oh you know dad was a runner so therefore i had to be a runner mm. which i was you know looking back i was like wow that i imagine that would be pretty hard to do because i see it like yeah. i mean i've not got kids not a partner or anything but I, you can as you get older start to be like well what will i do with my kids and all that and 100 yeah. percent as a bite you go sport <laughs> i'm gonna kick the, I, I think what I, I think what i get from you is you know energetically is you you enjoyed it yeah like you thrived it. There's definitely generations of us, you know, where a high majority of us loved it. Mm. I loved going to play, play sport, loved going to a carnival, uh, loved making a side. It was exciting. Yeah. You know, uh, and that's kind of the energy I get from you. you know, if anything, it helped you thrive. 100%. And it helped support you to have a competitive nature. Mm. So is that then just about you're trying to – as you get older, you're trying to like understand some of these internal frameworks that have been right, like that have been developed in you, yeah. which you didn't really have control over because yeah. it was what were your teachers doing, what were your sports or music, music coaches and teachers doing, and all parents, friends, everything. But now, as you get older, you have the opportunity to kind of look back at some of those things and yeah. maybe change some of the frameworks if need be as well. Yeah, well, I mean, there's there's a, there's a saying, you know, success leaves clues, and there's so much that you've experienced in your life that provides a lot of value mm. there's so many things in your life that were actually worked for you so like i grew up on a farm 100 acres and we grew uh, all polynesian vegetables yams taro uh, sweet potatoes um cassava or tapioca which is mm -hmm. like uh you know bubble tea yeah, yeah 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 so like tapioca they make that out of that and we we have we Planted, harvested, tended, weeded that whole hundred acres by hand. Wow! But we had a tractor that used to uh, dig up the sweet potatoes, but that was about it. And that's so a lot of land. Like. That's, that's a lot of land. <laughs> so, being one of twelve kids, that my dad, like he had us all out there working on the farm. Now, I hated it at the time, but guess what that did for me? Mm, the skill sets. It developed work ethic with inside of me. I love to work. Yeah. You know, I love to be useful. I love to be able to create, to build. I love working with my hands. I love being with nature. And at the time, I used to hate it. Mm. Absolutely hate it. But one thing I do know is I've never gone a day without a job. I think one, when, I, when I left high school, I had a school-based traineeship. When I finally left that factory, I lost my job one day. And I remember I threw a sickie and I was like I'd had a big weekend I threw a sickie and I'd had way too many sickies I'd been like I was in my late teens and maybe my early 20s and I went to the gym after that sickie and someone had seen me with a couple hundred kilos on the leg press and they said I saw Lino at the gym oh, no. right and I was just like <laughs> well for me 320 is light yeah I was just like it was no drama because back then I was I was like moving like five six hundred mm. so I was like this is like half my. This is, this is like half. <laughs> this is like light for me, and they were just like, you know what, you weren't really sick, and I was like, nah. <laughs> right, so I lost my job that day. I had another job the next day. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter where I've been in this world or whatever's going on in my life. There's always something going on. I always have a job, or, or I've always had a business. I've been working for myself since two thousand and five. Mm -hmm. 2004 to the year 2005 yeah. i think i've been wow. working for myself and you know so that's almost 20 years in business you know for myself but that work ethic comes from that place yeah where i hated it when i was a young person you know, my relationship with food comes from growing up on a farm i just thought that all food was normal like you plant a seed, you mm. water it, give it sun, it grows, that's food. That's a good perception of food at least. That's right. <laughs> and so when I was like, what's the go with organic? I remember when I was younger <laughs> and they go, well, it's food that hasn't, you know, been tampered with and it doesn't have all the chemicals in the GMO. I was like, isn't that normal food? That's just food. They go, nah, not the way that they look after food today. And I was like, wow, 
yeah, that was not what I understood about yeah. you know food to be. And so you know, my relationship with food comes from that place. So there's there's so many reasons why we do things, and there's so many ways that people look at things. So mm. you know, perception is everything. Perspective is everything, um, and where focus goes, you know, energy flows. So if mm. you're looking at it uh, from a place of, you know, mum and dad are hard on me, I could have looked at that the whole time. As much as I hated it, I was like, I want to go play with my friends. Yeah. Right? I don't see my friends working on a farm, being dirty, all their clothes dirty, our van, you know, is covered in mud, all red, red soil all the time. Um, but it developed a work ethic inside of me, but also a resilience and a perspective on life that I just wouldn't have had otherwise. Now, I, I don't really have a story about doing things. Mm. And what I mean by that is, is I don't really wait for people to give me permission to things. Like if something enters my mind and I want to do something, create something, build something, go somewhere, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Yeah. D- I think also yeah? like you, you've in that as well. You've you know business. Oh, there's a lot of days where you the tasks you have to do you don't want to do. Well, what did you do all along? Yeah. You did something every day that you didn't want to do. So Ex- you ad- that skill set in itself yeah. is just astronomical and so many people don't have it. Yeah. But like your ability to have that is just why you can continue to do what you do as well alongside of a lot of other things yeah. too. But I think it's just as well, like you, you know, how parenting, how you brought up, you know, my parents were pretty strict around a lot of things as well. Um, and I look back at the time, I was like, Fuck you! Why are you? No, oh, I want to do this. I want, I want to go to that party. I want to do this. Like, mm. and now I look back, I'm like, yeah, actually, you know, I'm not messed up, so I'm kind of happy my parents are strict. Yeah. Because if my <laughs> parents just tried to be my best friend and let me mm. get away with everything, uh, once again, we wouldn't be here. Who knows where mm. what would be happening? Like, it's I'm able to be who I am because of that. Obviously, when you're young, you just you're, mm. you're neglecting it because you're seeing the grass is greener over where my friends are. And and I was gonna say. You know, Mother Nature plays a role too, because when you grow up on a farm, you know you're at the mercy of the seasons. Yeah. So like when you're out there in the sun and you're working in the sun, it develops an appreciation for sweating, for hard work. Mm. You know, and then when you're in the rain, well, that changes. It. That makes your work, you know, even even more different. So understanding that Mother Nature moves in seasons helps give you a perspective that life moves in seasons as well. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think it's what that taps to our point earlier, you know, of the, the lows and the highs of the nervous system, the yeah. lows and the highs in the gym and all these sort of things as well. And yeah. I, um, I thought of it before and it fl- flicked my mind, but like that you kind of have to go, we don't have to, but I think it's important that you do go to extremes to then learn what that middle range is as well. We talked about it in yes, the 10 yeah, out of 10, yeah, but also- I remember like outside of school, worked so hard. Like I was just all the time, like if I was not working in the warehouse at the time, I was editing videos in the evening, I was training in the morning, you know, it was barely did anything. Then I was like, well, that's a bit much. But then I probably went the other way. I went too far reduction. And now I'm starting to find this really nice flow where I can work a lot, Uh but I can still go out and I go play golf on a Sunday with my mates. Yeah. And so I'm finding that that, but you had to experience the, too much of something or too little of something to understand where I should be hanging out, which will likely change in five years again. Yeah. But in the moment, I feel like I found a really nice spot because of that as well. Yeah, hundred percent. I I definitely believe that. And it's like if you if you think about that, you have an awareness of seasons. Mm. You know, with this approach to life, you understand nothing lasts forever. No. You know, so you know this this deep work period of your life that you're in. It's a season. Yeah. The only way it doesn't stay a season is if you don't stop doing it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Then it becomes the book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like this long ass chapter. Yeah, yeah. You know, that never changes. Yeah, yeah, which mm. is very interesting. Um, so what's the kind of work you've um the Inner Boy app? Obviously, that's um yeah. something you're working with now. What's the goal behind that? I became an ambassador for Inner Boy via a movement called She Is Not Your Rehab. And I I worked with those guys, and they're from New Zealand. Mm -hmm. I worked with them, oh, geez, it was 2019, so it's like five years ago. We They got me to come over to New Zealand, and I did a workshop with for them, and we've just been great friends ever since. So he was a barber, and his barbershop was called My Father's Barber. And the concept was that he, you know, I guess – cut God's children. Mm-hmm. I cut their hair. I am I am their barber and I 
Does this make sense? Yeah, yeah. So his relationship with men in the barber shop is where he developed the the movement. She is not your rehab with his wife, and what that basically means is that your partner is not your rehabilitation, mm-hmm. right? For your addiction, for your trauma, for whatever it is, you know, your baggage is, yeah? This is where men, you know, and we talked about it earlier on, the, the community of men and the brotherhood of men that you surround yourself is super important. What has evolved beyond that is they they wrote a book and that put them into high demand. So he ended up closing the barbershop and right now they've, they've as far as I understand, they've traveled the world, not only sharing the book, but sharing their work. And what's evolved from that has been this app that they worked, that they created through COVID. Mm-hmm. The Inner Boy app in New Zealand. Well, I think what happened was it was like 100,000 downloads. He was on the news and they interviewed him and he said, you know what, if you're going through a hard time, right, send me a message, I'll respond. And thousands, oh, thousands of people. Oh, shit, yeah, that was on, on, on the national news. So he was up for ages responding to all of these people. Yeah, wow. And he said, you know, it'd be great if there was an app that people could actually just use, you know, to help support them through this. So it when they launched, it was 100,000 downloads like ASAP. Then there was a, desire, a request for it to come to Australia. And they had, there was an Australian philanthropist, I'm pretty sure from Queensland, who said, I'll front the money to bring it over here and to develop it. Right. So that's what happened. They reached out to me to be one of the ambassadors. I jumped on board with it. It's a 30 day free men's mental health app. And it's, um, I can't remember what, what the actual, uh, innerboy.com.au, I'm pretty sure is what mm-hmm. it is. And it's like a web app. So when you jump on Safari and you go onto the website, you can click on and what you can do, I don't know if people realize this, is that you can bookmark a, you know what I'm talking yeah, about, yeah. to your your home screen. And then that becomes the direct link to the website, to yeah. the app. And it's this free men's mental health uh, app that you can do for 30 days. And I went on it and it's amazing. It's this amazing free resource. And think about it, if you're somebody who's starting to work on yourself but or you're needing to work on yourself, that can be quite confronting. Imagine if you're now having to go and go and engage with what we do at Men's Medicine, like these these groups. It's pretty intense. It, it jump. could be quite yeah, yeah. It could be a really, really big jump for a lot of people. So the Inner Boy app, not only is it able to be uh, done in the comfort of your own home, in the privacy of your own home. It's free. Yeah. And if you are, you know, coming from me, who's somebody who's in this space, when I looked at the app, it's a great resource, right? So I'm currently recommending it as a first step for anyone that's wanting to work on themselves and maybe they can't get to me in person. Maybe they can't get to one of my programs. Maybe they can't get to one of my workshops or one of my retreats. So it's like, I don't want to leave you hanging. So you can utilize this app over the next 30 days to support you. I'll also send you, you know, one of my free breathwork packs to help support you as well. So this way you've got some support resources to help you start working on yourself and get the ball rolling. Mm. Does that yeah, answer yeah. the question? Yeah, which is so important as well because <laughs> I guess the big – a lot of the guys have that stigma. They don't want to be seen in public <coughs> doing these sort of things. So maybe that's <coughs> that way that they can get – the initial steps mm. without the pressure of people and their what our perception of what people will be thinking uh-huh. and then they start doing it and they go oh no this is a good idea and then they go deeper with it as well yeah yeah 100 percent. that'd be powerful yeah well i really appreciate your time man like, that was a very deep conversation lots of stuff that i know people are going to walk away with um a bit of breath work routine in there as well that people if they're about to hit the gym do it because it'll make you wide deep work if you're about yeah. to go through a big bout at work you know try some of these techniques because they are very quick and effective as well. So I appreciate it. Thanks for having us, brother. Thanks, man. Cheers.